has joined. Good, I think everybody's with us. Good evening, everybody. I will hand over to you, to Mark Geller, and hope everybody enjoys the evening. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Institute of Jewish Studies of University College London, I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's talk. This evening's talk is a little bit out of uh, the ordinary for us. It's a little bit different from our usual procedures. That is that uh, we we have the pleasure this evening of hearing from someone who's a writer and an analyst and an independent uh, thinker and uh, whose book uh, was recently uh, uh, given great accolades by the Wall Street Journal, and it was also nominated now for the uh, National Jewish Book Award. And the other important point about this evening is that it's been a long time since we had anyone talking about the history of, of Zionism and the uh, earlier history of the State of Israel. It's it, it has not been a sort of fashionable topic for a long time, and it's very nice to come back to it. And it's very nice to come back to it from someone who uh, has an, takes an independent view of, of, uh, of the events and the history of these events. And with this very uh, interesting and, and well worth reading book. And uh, so we're glad now also to have the opportunity to, to, the opportunity to introduce this book uh, in here into the United Kingdom, where it's already been widely read in both in the United States and in Israel. So I'd like to, without any further delay, to ask our speaker, Mr. Oren Kessler, coming to us from Rochester, New York, to uh, to join us this evening and tell us about his book. Oren, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Geller. Thank you uh, to Sarah Ben Isaac. Uh, thank you to everyone at, at UCL uh, Hebrew and Jewish Studies. It's a real, real honor for me to to join you today. Uh, this event has been a, about a year in the making. Uh, I'm very, very glad that we could finally uh, make it happen after a number of uh, scheduling delays and uh, wars and relocations. I'm very glad uh, that we can make this happen. Um, this, uh, my book, Palestine 1936, uh, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict. Let me time myself to make sure I stick to our timetables here. This book is really the the first ever book for a general audience on the great uh, Arab revolt of 1936 to 39. Uh, this really formative, forgotten, uh, seminal chapter in the history of, of Palestine, in the history of uh, Zionism. Um, and of course, there are three sides to this triangle, to this story. There's the Arab side, the, the Jewish side, and the British side, of course. This is the British mandate Palestine. And the revolt was, was Arab, but I believe that this is a, and I argue in the book, that this is as much a, a Jewish story as um, as an Arab story, and one with real resonance and and, and relevance um, for our time. So, so let's get um, right into it. Uh, I know that many of you will be familiar with a lot of the, the history of, of, of the Holy Land and of uh, Zionism, but I want to uh, set the historical table uh, just a little bit. Um, very often when I give these uh, talks, I, I start with the Balfour Declaration, but I think today I'm going to start a little bit earlier, uh, nearly three years earlier, uh, with a man whose name will be known to some of you. That's uh, Herbert Samuel. Herbert Samuel was the first... Uh, observant or nominally observant uh, Jew in the British cabinet. He had a, a number of cabinet positions um, in the 1910s, postmaster general, chancellor of the, the Duchy of Lancaster. And he was, after uh, the First World War erupted, he was really, he wrote a memo called The Future of Palestine. This is a somewhat uh, forgotten uh, memo, but this was the first time that the issue of of Palestine and Zionism was put on the on the cabinet uh, table. Now, what I want to do here is just to share. Here we go. Share screen. And you'll bear with me. 
Oops. Here we are, and I will share screen and everything will look as it should. Oh. Okay, here is Mr. Herbert Samuel. There he is. With, uh, this is in 1921 with Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill. This is a few years after uh, the memo in question. Uh, Oh, okay. And um, this is what Herbert Samuel. Oh. Warren, do you want to put it on slideshow? Mode? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do here. There we are. Yeah, yes, that's it. Perfect. And here is what Herbert Samuel said in his memo uh, The Future of Palestine. He says he essentially waxes poetic about, quote, the dream of a Jewish state prosperous, progressive, and the home of a brilliant civilization. Palestine, he says, would, quote, add a luster even to the British crown and allow it to advance its historic role of civilizer of the backward countries. He writes, widespread and deep-rooted in the Protestant world is a sympathy with the idea of restoring the Hebrew people to the land which was to be their inheritance. And yet far more important would be the effect upon the character of the larger part of the Jewish race, the character of the individual Jew, wherever he might be, would be ennobled. The sordid associations which have attached to the Jewish name would be sloughed off. And finally, the Jewish brain is a physiological product not to be despised, he concluded in this cabinet memo. If a body be again given in which its soul can lodge, it may again enrich the world. So, let's now... So this is January 1915. The Ottomans have just entered the war, and he places this idea of Zionism on the cabinet table. Prime Minister Asquith is somewhat bemused and puzzled. He doesn't pay it much mind. Uh, but shortly thereafter, a new prime minister uh, comes to power. That's David Lloyd George. And as we know, in November 1917, uh, the Lloyd George ministry issues the famous, infamous Balfour declaration now one of the most one of the most fascinating uh, things that i've found one of the most fascinating troves of 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 uh, archival material that i found in this research were the secret peel commission testimonies and i'll get to the peel commission uh, a bit later but the, the the peel commission of course was called in response uh, to the uprise the great arab revolt in 1936 and uh the and they um the commissioners called dozens of witnesses for public testimony. Uh, these were high-level British administrators in Palestine. These were high-level Zionists. They were eventually uh, leading Palestinian Arabs after the Mufti called off his boycott. And these public testimonies were all released in 1937, along with this peer commission report, which I'll get to shortly. But alongside these public testimonies were dozens of private testimonies which were never meant to be released. Both the witnesses and the commissioners were under the impression uh, that they, they never would be released. They would be destroyed after the testimony uh, was given, and they were correspondingly extremely candid. Uh, but there was a very uh, far-sighted secretary to this commission, a man named J.M. Martin, who uh, stowed, uh, put away a few copies of these uh, testimonies for safekeeping at Whitehall and scribbled in the margins uh, saying that these ought to be uh, put away, stored, because they, they chronicle, quote, an important chapter in the history of Palestine and the Jewish people and will no doubt be of considerable value to the historians of the remote future. Well, we are the historians of uh, the remote future, and um, Whitehall very quietly declassified these uh, documents 80 years after the fact. So in 2017, these private testimonies were declassified without any fanfare, any email, any notification. And essentially, other than one scholar in Canada by the name of Layla Parsons, who has dipped her toe into these test into a couple a few of these testimonies, these have basically not been seen by scholars um, hardly at all. And so one of the mo one of the uh, secret witnesses who they brought in was none other than Lloyd George himself. Um, Lloyd uh, Arthur Balfour was already 
uh, dead at this point. He died in 1930. So this is already 1936, 37. And they bring in Lloyd George, again, prime minister during the Balfour Declaration. And they ask him, of course, uh, what were you thinking? Not, not in a, an accusatory way, but what were the motivations behind this uh, behind this declaration. And Lloyd George says, essentially, Lloyd George was a, a Zionist really from, from, you know, from 1917 on his, his entire life. And he essentially says that uh, public opinion in the US and Russia were crucial in this very dark period of the war, late 1917. And I'm going to read you a few quotes of what Lloyd George said. He said, we had every right at that time to believe that in both countries, namely the US and Russia, the friendliness or hostility of the Jewish race might make a considerable difference. He says, the war planners believed that the Jews, quote, could either hinder us or help us very materially because they have communities all over the world and they are a dangerous people to quarrel with, but they are a very helpful people if you can get them on your side. Uh, I actually wrote, uh, for those of you who are interested, I, uh, I wrote an article for Fathom uh, magazine, uh, whose title is A Dangerous People to, to Quarrel With, in which I really uh, dive into this testimony. Um, and so the, the, allies, uh, the allies win the war, as we know, the League of Nations is born, and the mandate begins. The mandate, let's not forget, this whole system of League of Nations mandates they may seem to us now in hindsight as sort of semi-colonialist or 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 a sort of cover for for colonialism but at the time they were really considered the product of sort of wilsonian progressivism these were um you know if it had been up to the victorious european powers perhaps the spoils of the ottoman empire might have been divvied up as 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 colonies but uh this this wilsonian idea was that these formerly subject peoples uh, particularly of the Ottoman Empire, should be sort of guided along um, in in development and towards eventual uh, self determination and 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 independence even, and so through some very effective um, Zionist lobbying, the and, and some friends in high places, particularly in London and in and in Geneva, where the um, where the League of Nations was based. Uh, the mandate for Palestine is given to Great Britain, to the country that had issued the Balfour Declaration on November 2nd, 1917. And, and even more so, it's not just given to Britain, but the mandate text, the sort of constitution of the mandate, if you like, enshrines the Balfour Declaration. And it says right there, right at the top in Article 2, I believe, that um, that the mandatory power, so namely Great Britain, the British Empire, on behalf of the League of Nations, on behalf of the international community of the time, shall facilitate Jewish immigration to Palestine, it being understood that nothing shall be done to um, impinge upon the um, religious and civil rights of the non-Jewish inhabitants, namely the Arabs. But notice that nothing is said about political rights or collective rights, not only uh, religious and civil, um, and uh, and shall facilitate close settlement of the land of, of, of Jews, okay? So this is a huge um, coup for the Zionists. The sort of international community at the time has kind of granted its imprimatur to uh, the Zionist project. Of course, uh, Palestinians then and now say, well, this international community is overwhelmingly European and we had no role in this uh, decision. But nonetheless, Italy, France um, uh, are on board, um, uh, the U.S. is not part of the League of Nations because it doesn't pass Congress, but the Wilson administration also gives its uh, assent to this, and the mandate begins. And who uh, is named as High Commissioner but Herbert Samuel himself, the man who wrote that memo uh, five or six years previously. Uh, he is Lloyd George, uh, is sort of shows his continued commitment to Zionism by appointing Herbert Samuel, a Jew, a Zionist, um to this position and um in one of his and he arrives in palestine in 1920 and um one of his very first acts as high commissioner is uh to choose a mufti because the previous grand mufti of jerusalem a man named uh, kamal al husseini dies of an illness at 54 and there's and samuel has barely arrived in palestine and he's already faced with a uh, succession crisis 
And so let's see if our tech works a little better this time. There we are. In one of the great blunders of the history, <laughs> in perhaps the first major blunder in what would be um, a long history of blunders in the Holy Land, he names, Herbert Samuel names, a man by the name of Amin al-Husseini to be Mufti, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He's the half-brother of the late former Mufti, who worked very, very well with the British and indeed with the Jews. And here are two photos from my book in which you may have to uh, get a little closer, but you can see um, you can see before, these are these are basically ID photos, uh, passports, laissez-passes of Amin al-Husseini before and after he is named as uh, Mufti. And you can see before he takes up the position, he's just sort of an, an effendi, he's an aristocrat from an important uh, Jerusalem family, but you can see he's uh, listed as, his occupation is listed as proprietor. Uh, Amin Husseini. Two years later, 1923, he's already in religious garb. His name appears as Hajj Muhammad Amin al Husseini. So he's got Muhammad in there. He's got Hajj to indicate that he's been on the Hajj to Mecca, which is really no great thing to boast about. Very many prominent Arabs would have made the Hajj. Uh, and you can see for occupation, he's listed as Grand Mufti and head of the Supreme Muslim Council, which is another sort of uh, institution that Samuel comes up with to deal with. Uh, all of the religious prerogatives and obligations that the Ottomans uh, used to deal with. And uh, Amin is made head of that as well. So I don't really have time to get into all of the uh, all of the various maneuverings that led to Amin being chosen there. I have I, there's, I wrote an article for Times of Israel. If you Google uh, my name and Herbert Samuel in Times of Israel, um, I kind of this was another secret testimony from the Peel. Uh, commission, which they called in Herbert Samuel, and they say, why did you appoint this guy? What were you thinking? Because by this point, it's clear that Sa that um, Hajj Amin is anti-British, anti-Zionist, uh, pro-Nazi. He's essentially leading the Arab revolt. And um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very illuminating and not very flattering uh, self-defense that, that Herbert Samuel mounts, in which he essentially says, well, nobody else in Palestine fit the bill. Uh, but again, not particularly convincing. The, the bottom line is that Samuel and company decided that the Husseini family needed to keep that position for various reasons. And the family had lined up behind this young man, Amin al-Husseini, who promised he would behave himself. And um, Samuel just completely misjudged who this who this person is. So the mandate begins, and as tends to happen in uh, in that part of the world where I, I believe I still live, or I certainly did until September, um, violence breaks out on a number of occasions in 1920 at Nabi Musa, 1921 in Jaffa and elsewhere, and then famously and infamously in uh, Hebron. Uh, Tzfat and a few other places in 1929. And very often when I start telling people about uh, my book, they they say, oh, you mean, um, you mean Hebron? You mean the Hebron massacre? To which the answer is, of course, no. The core of my book begins seven years after the Hebron massacre. The, the, the Hebron riots uh, were just that. They were a few days of very grim, excuse me, and gruesome attacks against Jews in, in Hebron, Tzfat, and, and a few other places. Attacks that really recalled the atrocities of October 7th in their brutality. Um, but I, I believe, and I argue in the book, that that's sort of all they were. These, this was terrorism, this was violence, these were riots, but this was not a sustained nationalist uh, uprising. This was not an intifada in the parlance of our times. Um, the first time we see anything on that scale is, as you could probably guess, uh, 1936. And so, and so let's having set the table, let's, I want to, uh, to get more directly into the, 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 the content of my book. There's really no way to, to understand, uh, the outburst, the outbreak of the revolt without looking at demographics, the sort of the demographic question is the backdrop to this entire period and this entire revolt really in uh of course hitler comes to power in january 1933 there are other uh, anti-semitic movements on the rise across europe in poland and hungary and romania uh, 
And really, this just has the effect of, of, of just the Jewish immigration to Palestine just skyrockets. And so in uh, 1935, for example, two years after Hitler comes to power, uh, Jewish immigration to Palestine reaches 60,000. Okay, And that's twice as much as the year before. And it's quite clear to the Arabs of Palestine, they're perceptive enough, not just the intelligentsia and the elites in the cities, but even subsistence farmers in the countryside, many of whom are still illiterate in this in this period. It's they're, they're perceptive enough to realize that the the face of, of the land is changing, that if things continue this way, uh, the Jews will be a majority before long. And there's a, a man whose name will be known uh, to many of you. Uh, and I will show you his face. It's Iz Adin al Qassam. That's the man in the middle there on the cover of Philistine newspaper, which came out in Jaffa. Iz Adin al Qassam was a preacher, a uh, jihadi preacher. He was originally from, from Syria, from the Latakia area. He came down. Um, he came down to Haifa in the early 1920s because he was causing trouble in Syria. He was wanted by the French authorities there. So he comes down to Haifa and he is uh, the imam of a mosque in Haifa called Istiklal Mosque. You can, it's still an active mosque. You can go visit. And he's preaching jihad. He's essentially saying, and this is right at the beginning of the mandate, but he's preaching things like um, to the urban Muslim poor, things like when the British officer comes and uh, you know, presents his boot for you to to shine. Leave the brush in the shine box and take out a pistol. That sort of thing. And his uh, followers, in the starting in the early to mid 1930s, start waging uh, attacks against British targets and against Jewish uh, individuals. And some of these are deadly, and they actually end up killing. A Jewish member of the Palestine police by the name of Moshe Rosenfeld, uh, who incidentally was known as the best horseman in Palestine. But they kill Officer Rosenfeld in what is now uh, the Northern West Bank. And he's now a wanted man because Qassam and his acolytes have killed a member of uh, His Majesty's police. And a, a, a manhunt ensues, a gunfight ensues. And long story short, Qassam is killed again, in the in the in the northern West Bank, Nablus, Janin area, uh, what we now call the West Bank. And really, Qassam becomes the first sort of martyr icon. He becomes the 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 first martyr icon in the Palestinian Arab pantheon. He's you can see here, this is late 1935 that he's killed. You can see here, this is July 1936, this newspaper, and you can see the the central uh, position that he has here. Um, you can see the, the the great respect with which he's he's uh, held up. And Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion, who um, is even at this, Ben-Gurion even at this time is the sort of clear leader, uh, almost uncontested leader of the Jews of Palestine. He's head of the uh, Jewish agency. And Ben-Gurion recognizes the significance of Qassam's death immediately. And he writes in his diary, finally, the Arabs have found a man who's willing to die for an ideal. And he predicted there would be hundreds or thousands more like him. And of course, uh, Qassam today lends his name to the uh, Hamas armed wing, the Hamas terror wing that, uh, that carried out the atrocities of October 7th. They are the Izzadin al-Qassam brigades. And so uh, that's Ben-Gurion's prediction. And indeed, a few months later, in April 1936, a few of Qassam's followers ambush a car get driving through, again, that same area, Nablus, Janine area that the, that the British called the Triangle of Terror, which even today is a very much a, a hub of Palestinian militancy. Uh, there, the, there's a, a Jewish car. It's a Jewish uh, poultry merchant who's uh, he and his driver are driving along the highway, collecting chickens from the Arab farmers in the area to sell in Tel Aviv. They're ambushed. They are killed. And really, in many ways, uh, this is considered the the op these are considered the opening shots of um, the Arab revolt. And then just a few days after that, there's something called the Bloody Day in Jaffa, in which 
over two days, uh, 19 Jews are, are killed in Jaffa and Tel Aviv. And it's really clear to everyone, to Jews, to Arabs, to Britons, that uh, this is a new phase in the conflict. That something, uh, this is this is something something new under under the sun. And so the the revolt begins in in violence, in sort of grassroots, unplanned uh, violence. But the 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 Mufti very much sort of rushes to assert control uh, over the revolt, to sort of assert his political leadership. Uh, over it. And within a few days, he basically announces the creation of something called the Arab Higher Committee, which naturally he uh, uh, names himself to be the head of. Um, and um, he basically announces that the the violence and an, and and in, and an um, economic strike will continue until three major demands are met because alongside these acts of violence, the Arabs begin, boycotting uh, the Jewish economy and the British economy. There's just a general uh, strike that begins sort of alongside these, these acts of violence and these political demands. So the Mufti says that vi the violence and the strike will continue unless three demands are met. What are those three demands? A complete uh, cessation of Jewish immigration, a ban on uh, land sales, because very many uh, prominent Arabs were selling land quite happily at inflated prices to Jews, even while they railed against the practice uh, in public. And then the uh, the third demand was the creation of a sort of legislative assembly, a legislature, one that would reflect uh, the demographics of Palestine, which are still at least 70% Arab in this period. And, um, and so really, the this is kind of the mufti's finest hour this is the moment in which rival families um rich and poor urban and rural uh, christian and muslim in, to a large extent really line up uh behind at least ostensibly uh behind the mufti's leadership uh and in a common purpose against a common foe namely zionism and its uh, british imperial facilitators and this strike uh, continues for six months. This is even to this day one of the longest general strikes anywhere uh, in history. And this is a source of tremendous pride for the Arabs of Palestine, the sort of uh, self-sacrifice that they've showed economically and, and, and otherwise. And really, this is, I argue in the book, that this is, the, the, this is when the revolt really starts to become sort of the crucible of, of Palestinian Arab identity. This is really, um, in many ways, this is this is just the sort of formative uh, event in, in, in creating uh, that Palestinian Arab identity. And, and that strike, that six month strike that I mentioned really uh, bears fruit because the British send a royal commission. This is the Peel Commission uh, that I discussed earlier. And I've got some photos here. Uh, they send a commission acting in the name of the king. This is the highest level commission of inquiry that the British Empire has, the British government. And it's acting in the name of the uh, very short-lived king, Edward VIII, um, who would shortly thereafter abdicate famously. But, but in the in the five or 10 minutes in which he was on the throne, he managed to, to put together this, uh, to, to the, this, this commission uh, headed by Lord Peel and, um, here we've got some photos here this these are uh three of the commissioners that's uh lord peel the chair of the commission with the mustache uh that's um horace rumbold to his right and to his left is reginald reginald copeland or copeland he's an oxford don he's an expert in um colonial history african history and as i uncover in the book He's really the prime mover of the commission, but I'll get to that more in a moment. Of course, to the left is Amir Abdullah, the British appointed uh, Amir of Transjordan. And so, um, and so the commission comes, they, uh, the commission spends um, months in the country. Right, can you see me or the photo at this point? They spend, uh, 
They spend months in the country. They interview dozens of um, high level uh, Zionists and uh, high level uh, British administrators. Here we go. And again, high level. Oh, there we are. And the Mufti, who initially uh, boycotts the proceedings, eventually relents at the 11th hour, and then they meet high-level uh, Arabs, including uh, including the the Emir of, of Transjordan. And they put together a report, which clocks in at about 400 pages, and it's actually quite um, it's quite a good read. If anyone has you know the entire month of uh, February free, I strongly suggest that they that they read it because it's actually I've, I've read all of the commissions of inquiry uh, throughout the British mandate, and this is by far uh, by far the best read. It's got context, it's got uh, it's got style, it's got a lot of um, very illuminating uh, analysis, but it's really remembered by history for its last twelve or fourteen pages in which. Uh, the commissioners propose a plan of partition. Here's one more photo of um, Chaim Weizmann, head of the World Zionist Organization, uh, appearing before the committee. So they come up with this uh, drastic, um, this dramatic and drastic change to their to British policy for Palestine, which is partition, division. This is the first time that uh, a two-state solution, if you like, appears on the international agenda in any real way. This is the first time that a Jewish state appears on the agenda in any real way. Not just a Jewish national home, as promised by the Balfour Declaration, but a state with everything that means. And it's really extremely, it's really fascinating to hear uh, when you when you go through the minutes of of and the and the sessions and the testimonies of the Peel Commission to watch as Professor Copeland, who was not a Middle East expert, had very little acquaintance with Palestine previously, how he really takes the lead um, based on apparently the model, in many ways, the model of the 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 the, the division and the population exchange between Greece and Turkey after the First World War. He really gets uh, gets into his head that division can work, and you can watch him pushing this idea and pushing this idea and finding British administrators who uh, who will uh, affirm that that's the right uh, way to go. And over a few, really a few pages, this is sort of the last few days in which they're in the country. Over a few pages of testimony, they really iron out some very. Uh, fateful decisions, such as uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a portion there where he asks a British administrator, okay, so um, so wh what do you think? Is this is this possible? Is this doable? And this administrator by the name of Douglas Harris, who's an irrigation uh, expert, comes up with a map and he says, okay, I think we should give the Jews from you know from basically from Rehovot up the coast and then the Galilee and and then you know and then. Uh, and then the commissioners ask them, OK, so does this mean a Jewish army? He says, yeah, I think so. And they're and they're making these really fateful decisions just sort of uh, on the fly almost. And um, and so the report comes out in the summer of 1937 and a raucous debate uh, ensues um, within the Jewish Zionist leadership. Uh, there's a there's a Zionist Congress that's called in, um, in Zurich and uh, there's there's significant opposition on both right and left, even on the sort of more uh, leftist flank of Ben Gurion and and Weizmann. There's significant opposition, even among labor uh, Zionists, and of course the right wing Zionist movement of led by Vladimir Jabotinsky rejects partition out of hand uh, as as a you know a tremendous betrayal. But the two Jews whose uh, opinion matters more than anyone are Ben Gurion and Weizmann. And as much as they uh, play coy and sort of suggest that maybe yes and maybe no, uh, you know, I've read their uh, internal correspondence, I've read their diaries, and they were both ecstatic. They were both euphoric. And Weizmann famously says uh, that they should accept, they would have to accept um, such a plan, even such a state, even if it were the size of a tablecloth. And I, and I, it's, it's clear that both of them don't believe that the very small state that um, is offered would be the final word, but rather sort of a foothold. Basically, the Jews are offered, again, from about Rehovot 
up the coast. And then they're given sort of the prize of the Galilee, which is overwhelmingly Arab uh, at this point as a sort of interior, a hinterland for their for their Jewish state. Um, and so a raucous debate ensues, but ultimately Ben-Gurion and Weizmann prevail and they indicate their uh, support of this plan with certain reservations. The Arabs, the Arab leadership represented by the Mufti rejects this out of hand. He calls the Mufti calls it an amputation, a degradation, a humiliation. And um, and the, the commission had gone back to England. And so it, and a sort of a waiting game begins uh, to see if they will actually uh, implement it. Um, a few months after that, a high-level British administrator named Lewis Andrews is gunned down uh, on his birthday as he's attending Evensong at the Anglican Church in Nazareth. And uh, the revolt, which has been sort of suspended while the commission is in the country, the revolt flares up anew, much more strongly uh, than before. And the Mufti is a wanted man at this point because it's uh, it's 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 fairly clear to everyone that he's pulling the, the the strings of the revolt. It's not to say that he's uh, sending every last attacker to to kill Jews or to kill uh, Brits, um, but uh, it's clear that he's guiding the revolt along the main path. And at this point, after about six months of revolt, something like eighty five Jews have already uh, have already been killed at this point. Um, and so the Mufti is a wanted man, and he flees uh, famously to Lebanon. Uh, some scholars believe he was dressed as a woman. I happen to believe he was dressed as a Bedouin, but he flees uh, to Jaffa port, makes his way uh, to Beirut, and he will not return to Palestine for four decades. Um, and so the the revolt is flaring anew, uh, but the British very much have a problem because the 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 war clouds are gathering uh, over Europe. It seems to be a question of when and not if. Uh, war with Hitler is going to erupt, and and the British are simply unable to send large numbers of of manpower of troops to uh, Palestine. And so, what do they do? They agree to a longstanding Jewish Zionist demand to arm and train the Jews in large numbers. And this here is, if anyone uh, perhaps could recognize the man who's pointing, that's Moshe Dayan pre eye patch. I think it's the only uh, photo I've been able to find of him, other from when, other than when he's a, a child, a teenager, in which he he doesn't have the eye patch. But here he is leading uh, members of the Jewish supernumerary police. In Hebrew, they're called notrim, and really, uh, these were basically throughout the course of the revolt, something like fifteen or twenty thousand Jews are trained and armed and very often paid by the Palestine police, namely by the British government in Palestine. Uh, but it's clear to, it's, 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 it's fairly self-evident that they ultimately answer to the Haganah, namely the mainstream Jewish armed group, self-defense group, which is still technically illegal at this point, but which the British turn a blind eye to as long as it uh, behaves itself and limits, it, limits itself to, to self-defense. Uh, and so through this process of the of the Jewish supernumerary police, the Notrim, basically the British create the seed of a Jewish army. This is when the Haganah goes from being a glorified, a, a network of glorified, uh, you know, night uh, night watchmen to really the seed of a Jewish army, and it's all through British facilitation. This is also the period of a man named Ord Wingate, who was a, a British officer stationed in Palestine. Many of you will know his name. He was a Christian fundamentalist, a very eccentric man, but but um, a, a devout Zionist. And most important of all, he was a, a military genius by, by all accounts. And he created a unit called the Special Night Squads, which was a mixed British Jewish unit, which was really the first uh, Jewish special forces, if you like. And, and they would operate at night, they would uh, go on the offensive against these Arab armed uh, groups, and they had tremendous success. And this was really uh, the seed of uh, the future IDF officer corps. This included men like Moshe Dayan and like uh, Igar Alon, who would be leaders of the Israeli army. And so um, 
And so really the revolt, let me see how I'm doing on time here. Okay. The revolt sort of reaches its peak really in mid 1938. And it's only, um, it's only really with the Munich crisis. It's only when Chamberlain, Prime Minister Chamberlain flies to Germany and, and, uh, and, and has the meeting in Munich in, at which, after which much of Britain and indeed the world breathes a sigh of relief that war has been averted at least uh, for now. It's only after the Munich crisis that Britain is able to send over large numbers of troops to Palestine. And that's what it does. And it engages in very heavy handed, uh, some would even say brutal acts of uh, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism um, and uh, pacifying the country. This is the period in which home demolitions begin on a major scale. This is when uh, you first see administrative detention, namely detaining suspects without any uh, particular charges based on emergency regulations. Collective punishment was simply uh, part of the game. If a, if a mine was laid along a highway, the British officer would show up at the nearest village, would take out the Mukhtar, the village headman, and ask, okay, who did it? And if the Mukhtar couldn't tell him, that he would, uh, they would start demolishing uh, houses. Um, at least 100 Arabs were hanged during this period. Uh, thousands were killed in British uh, military operations. There are a couple of well-documented uh, atrocities, particularly in the village of uh, Halhul and uh, Al-Basa, which are both uh, in the book. Uh, and um, and really the sort of uh, Arab social fabric is really, you know, is really torn by all of these, um, by all of these operations. Thousands of fighting age men are either killed or imprisoned. Huge numbers of weapons are confiscated. And all of these operations are really helped along by what is a convulsion of Arab infighting. So the sort of initial unity of the Arab revolt under the Mufti uh, that I mentioned earlier really devolves in the second phase from late 37 to 38, 39. And really what you see is, uh, is basically, a you, you see rival families uh, and rival sort of warlords uh, if you like, maybe warlords is a bit too strong, but you see rival families using the revolt uh, as a cover under which to sort of settle old scores. And so um, really what 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 British operations begins, uh, Arab infighting really finishes. And the revolt is very much um, sort of on, on the ropes at this point. By the time 1938 turns into 1939, uh, the revolt is is uh, sort of a shadow of its of its former self, uh, but the British, with their sort of uh, endless lust for commissions and committees and conferences, uh, call the Jews and the Arabs together um, to St James's Palace in London. This is uh, this is the era of appeasement, right? This is not appeasement was not just a term used by people like Winston Churchill who opposed the policy. This was essentially government policy for the Chamberlain ministry and not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Nazi Germany and uh, fascist Italy, but but vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East as well. You can see in the cabinet uh, minutes, they talk about appeasing Arab and Muslim opinion. The, the government was particularly worried about the large Muslim population of India, uh, this is, of course, pre-partition in India, of course. This includes modern-day Pakistan and Bangladesh with their large Muslim populations. And, and the, the, the government was worried that if the Muslims of the empire uh, were unhappy about Palestine, that they, may, that they might not be on board uh, for the war effort. And that would cause very, strate very serious strategic problems uh, for the British. And so they are determined to, quote-unquote, and again, these are their words, appease uh, Arab and Muslim opinion over Palestine. They call together this conference, but the 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 result of this conference is very much um, is very much a foregone conclusion. And uh, got some more photos for you here. The colonial secretary at the time is this man, 
It's Malcolm McDonald. He's only about 36 years old at this point. He's the son of Ramsey McDonald, the first Labour Prime Minister. Uh, and he is sort of uh, the master of ceremonies, shall we say, at this conference. And the, um, the, the result of which is, again, you know, this is several weeks of conference and back and forth. But again, the conclusion is essentially foregone. It's only a question of how much the British will roll back this Zionist uh, experiment. And uh, the result is the, um, the famous MacDonald uh, white paper of 1939. This is, of course, a critical time uh, for the Jews of Europe. This is already mid-1939. And what uh, they're, they, of course, they're desperate to leave uh, to leave Europe. And what the white paper says is that essentially uh, it, Jewish immigration, which, as I mentioned, had reached 60,000 in 1935, according to this white paper, uh, total Jewish immigration over the next uh, five years would be um, would be only 75,000. OK, so from 60,000 in a single year to 75,000 spread over five years after which any further Jewish immigration would be contingent upon Arab consent. And if it was clear to everyone that that consent would not be forthcoming. And so this is seen as a tremendous betrayal by the Zionists. These, this is a photo of protests in Tel Aviv. You can see the people watching uh, from the rooftops and you can see the British, uh, the, the, the British policemen chasing after some Jews with clubs, it looks like. Uh, and this is really a tremendous blow to uh, Zionist aspirations at the time when, of course, the Jews need a refuge um, more than ever. Now, my my time is uh, ticking away here, so I want to I want to just talk a bit about um, about the legacies of this revolt and and specifically what what's promised in the title here, which is how uh, the the Jews and the Zionists led by Ben Gurion turned at this adversity into uh, advantage because this was an extremely painful time uh, for the Jews of, for the Yishuv, the pre-state Jewish community in, in the Holy Land. This was, um, 500 Jews were killed in these three years of revolt. These are massive numbers that we wouldn't see until the second intifada uh, and 250 British servicemen, by the way, roughly. Um, but despite that tremendous pain, the the Jews made advances on virtually every front. So, um, you know, economically, Ben Gurion saw in the revolt a tremendous source of leverage to reach his long term goal of creating a self sufficient uh, Jewish economy, a self sufficient Jewish polity that could feed itself, house itself, employ itself, defend itself without any help from the Arabs or from uh, the British. Um, in terms of settlement, not a single settlement is abandoned during the Arab Revolt, but rather dozens more spring up around the country. This is the period of uh, wall and tower. This is when the wall and tower campaign begins. There was an old Ottoman law that if you put up a structure within 24 hours, uh, it couldn't be taken down. So the Jews take full advantage of this and put up new settlements in strategic uh, parts of the country. Militarily, I already mentioned the tremendous uh, gains that were made. And just sort of psychologically, I think the transformation that the Jews undergo in this period is uh, cannot be overstated. I think the the illusions that many uh, Zionists, especially labor Zionists, had before the revolt that you know if we just come and show the Arabs a, a better way to plow their fields and we'll drain some swamps, they'll see the blessings that that we're bringing. I think that illusion was very much. Uh, shattered in this period, and there was a realization that the 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 fate of the country would be ultimately determined and maintained uh, by by force of arms. And so, in all of these ways, I I argue that the the sort of the the kernel, the core of the Jewish state to be, is really formed in already by 1939 when this white paper is passed. The World War begins. The Jews have the kind of springboard that they would use to gain their independence a decade down the road. And when you look at the Arab side, it's really the mirror image of that. The Arab social fabric is completely torn. 
I mentioned thousands of Arabs who are who are killed, thousands more in prison. Huge numbers of guns are are confiscated. The economy is completely gutted um, by the strike. Um, you know, tremendous amounts of bad blood within Arab society because of this infighting that I spoke about. And so really, the the revolt to crush uh, Zionism really ends up crushing the Arabs themselves. Um, and so really, uh, kind of, and I think this is a good place to stop, the book argues that the, the final reckoning, the final showdown between Jews and Arabs uh, within the Holy Land, within Palestine, that we see in 1947-48, is really won by one side and lost by another uh, nearly 10 years in advance. So I think that's a good place uh, to stop, and I'm very happy to uh, to take your questions. Thank you very much for a really fascinating talk, uh, Owen, and very clearly presented, and the illustrations were great. And we have some interesting questions in the chat. But before I turn to the chat, I would like to ask a sort of background question that for, to present something that maybe you don't know about. In Germany, at the University of Greifswald, which is a small university in the northeast of, of uh, Germany, there is an important exhibition of glass slides, hundreds and maybe, maybe several thousand, of Palestine, taken over a 30-year period by someone named Gustav Dahlmann, who was a great expert, a Christian, but expert on, on, on the Babylonian Talmud. In Talmudic Aramaic, and he was kicked out of uh, after the war. He was kicked out of uh, of Palestine by the British for being a Nazi sympathizer, and he went back to Germany and took all of his collection. And if you go to Greifswald and you look through these uh, hundred thousand, I think several thousand slides, what you don't see is the landscape looks entirely empty. Hmm. You don't see anybody living there. You know? This is. And, and slide after slide after slide is an empty landscape. And even Jerusalem, there's nothing outside the walls. So mm. I'm interested in these demographics that you mentioned about 30, 70, et cetera. Uh, do we really have accurate uh, statistics and figures of the Democrat, the demography, the democratic statistics uh, in the 1930s from, from Palestine? And, and, and wasn't it true that the Mufti actually encouraged a kind of aliyah of uh, Arabs to come to Palestine, or am I wrong about that? Well, the British were very meticulous record keepers, and every few years they would take a census. We still had those censuses, and they they indicate, to the best of their knowledge, anyway, the exact uh, the exact population of every village and the religious breakdown thereof. But it is true that um, there there was, and this is harder to quantify, but there was definitely a dynamic of seasonal migration in which Arabs from the surrounding countries, particularly from places like uh, the Horan region, <laughs> Syria, would uh, would come in depending on, on the season and work in various agricultural jobs uh, and then leave. And so uh, or, or some didn't, because, of course, the the economy, the opportunities in Palestine were unlike anything else in the Middle East. There was no uh, there was no comparison. So there's it's and it's very difficult to know. Um, you know that there were there were ebbs and flows in illegal Jewish immigration, which the British tried their best to uh, get a hold of and keep track of. But it's very it's much more difficult to know how many Arabs uh, came in illegally, how many of them stayed, how many of them left. Um, yeah. So, um, but but really, the just just the 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 country is really transformed, starting in the twenties from a, really a backwater of the Ottoman Empire, and then by the thirties. I mean, the, just the pace of growth just is, is you, you you can read accounts of almost any visitor to the country in the 30s, and they're just astonished by how much the landscape is changing uh, from the beginning of the 30s to the end of the 30s. Well, thank you very much. So we have Gila ask a question specifically about the Arab revolts. He wants to know, can you flesh out the Arab aims and politics during the revolt? And also, she says, the identities. Yeah, it's a very good question. The the so the the three specific aims they were quite clear about: ending Jewish immigration, uh, ending lands, banning land sales, and uh, and setting up a, a legislative assembly. But the final political goal was not always entirely clear. For example, when 
when the Mufti rejected the Peel Commission partition plan and then subsequently rejected the white paper, I didn't mention, but the white paper didn't go far enough for the Mufti and from his exile, he rejected it. Um, he, he, he often talked about, you know, Palestine will remain forever Arab and it will be part of an Arab federation. So it was not entirely clear, you know, the, the, what we hear today about, you know, about you know Palestine from the river to the sea as a distinct unit was not entirely clear at all. Um, the, so that that seems to be the sort of vague ambition that the Mufti had uh, was for him, perhaps he to lead the Palestinian portion of a wider Arab federation in the Levant. Um, but it was never exactly spelled out. The only thing that was spelled out very clearly was was the was the complete opposition to uh, to Zionist immigration in anything but very small numbers. So uh, uh, David Benukovsky asks a question about Ben Gurion. He says in 1937 he wrote to his son to liberate the entire country. Uh, did he mean uh, with our right to settle? Was he specifically talking about the Negev and Transjordan? Do you think? Um. The certainly the the Jabotinskyites considered the as they saw it, the amputation of Transjordan by Churchill in 1921 as a tremendous betrayal, as lopping off uh, a huge part of their patrimony. I think Ben Gurion had mostly come to terms with it at that point, although there were ongoing efforts by the Zionists to buy land in Transjordan and to see if if that could be uh, arranged. There's another thing we didn't really talk about uh, at all, but the, there is the Peel Commission in about one sentence uh, talks, raises this idea of transfer. And this has been um, and this is something it, 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 uh, that that historians have have spilled quite a bit of, of ink over. Uh, there, there, but there's this one sentence in which they suggest that just as gr just as the the ulcer was cut out, quote unquote, um, among Greeks and Turks after World War Two, uh, World War One, excuse me. This uh, the same dynamic uh, should take place between Arabs and Jews, and shortly thereafter, the the British walked that back and and disowned that particular recommendation. But Ben Gurion, it has to be said, was thrilled by this prospect, and um, and he basically says this is something we never wanted, we never could have asked for, uh, we didn't want to displace the Arabs, and yet if the British are only giving us a slice of our patrimony, um, you know this is this is. Um, this is this is something we have to embrace with both hands. Yeah. So Anna Gordon asks two questions. She wants to know about the name of the first Jewish armed police, and at what year did the British start their punishment of the Arabs? And did the revolt take place all over the country or just in certain areas? So yeah, the the uh, the unit was called the Jewish Supernumerary Police. It's a bit of a mouthful. In Hebrew, they were called Notvim. Uh, they were often known as gaffers also, which comes, comes from the Arabic. Um, and, um, and the, the revolt was countrywide. Of course, there were ebbs and flows geographically and, 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 um, chronologically, um, Jaffa was a real center of revolt. The cover of my book, this is old Jaffa. Uh, if you go now to old Jaffa, there's something uh, called the anchor, the Ogin in Hebrew, which is basically this wide swath uh, it's really the only place you can drive a car through in in Old Jaffa, and that was that was uh, cleared by the British in uh, the summer of 1936 because they considered Jaffa a den of terrorism, and they, and they they didn't have access to to, to pacify it. Um, the Janine and Nablus area were were very much centers of militancy. Jerusalem, um, um, Gaza was not interestingly enough. Uh, Gaza was actually. Uh, the mayor of Gaza was a member of the Nashashibi clan, which was the sort of opposition to the Mufti, to the Husseinis, and they were generally much more um, moderate. It was the Nashashibis actually accepted the Peel partition plan, at least privately. And this raises just a tremendous what if, what if that partition plan had gone through? Uh, what if the white paper had not gone through? Um, what if someone other than the Mufti had been named by Herbert Samuel? What if a Nashashibi had been named to that extremely powerful position? Um, and so, um, yeah, so the revolt lasted from 1936 to 39. And then when, and then it was kind of, as I mentioned, on its last legs by 39. And then once the world war began, um, again, the kind of the, the final reckoning was kind of, uh, postponed. So just one last question. 
a very interesting question from Howard Lewis. He asks about, can we link the narratives of the suppression of the revolt with the exile of the Palestinian Arab leadership, the sort of Nakba of 1948? Can we, is there a link that we can establish? Well, absolutely, because one the uh, the one of the many ways in which the Arab social fabric was so torn in this period is that the, is that the elites simply fled the country in large numbers. There was something like um, there was something like forty thousand Palestinian Arabs in in Beirut alone, I believe. There was a huge exodus of people, overwhelmingly people with means who could flee, and and of course, at, when when things calmed down, they came back to Palestine. And I think very many of them believed that in 48, it would be a similar dynamic. They would leave, they would sit out the fighting, and then they would come back. Uh, but of course, that wasn't possible in 1948-49. Uh, so um, in so many ways, it was a preview, um, a preview uh, uh, of 1948 to 49. The Palestinian American scholar Rashid Khalidi calls it, calls 48 to 49 a tragic postlude, an epilogue uh to 36 to 39 so so i think this is a good time to draw this discussion to a close to say we can now appreciate why the wall street journal has rated your book so highly and i'm sure many of us will want to read it particularly we can get it at a 30 percent uh discount as you can find on the uh that uh Vic vicky put on the screen and also we hope you get uh also, the accolade of the National Jewish Book Award. This would be, uh, for our point of view, this is well deserved because you've really given us a very interesting, clearly presented, and uh, fascinating talk this evening. And uh, in future, we'd like to invite you back again. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think we all owe you a great uh, vote of thanks. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's you, been a pleasure Bye. and an honor to be with you. Bye. Thanks again. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to our lovely audience. And we look forward to seeing you again with our next lecture is on Tuesday, next Tuesday, about Odessa, different subject. Bye-bye, right. yeah. right. everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.